Good afternoon and thank you all for joining us today for the latest webinar from the American Bar Association's Civil Rights and Social Justice section brought to you by our Education Committee. Uh, we are truly in unprecedented uh, times right now um, and as such Today's webinar will address some of the complexities that COVID-19 has created, particularly in the education context. Uh, we really thank you all for taking the time to join us this afternoon and for your interest and engagement in these issues as we all are, are working to navigate a new reality. The Civil Rights and Social Justice section is committed to offering programming like this that is responsive to addressing the civil rights implications of, of issues that arise like COVID-19 and helping to equip lawyers to be responsive to help preserve and protect civil rights. I bring greetings from our section chair, Wendy Mariner, and the Education Committee co-chairs, Christy Susie and Cynthia Swan, as well as special advisor, Beth Wittenberry. Thanks also to Jerry Gardner, our section director. I'm Janelle George. I'm also a co-chair of the Civil Rights and Social Justice Section's Education Committee, but today I'm speaking in my personal capacity. I would also like to thank and acknowledge our sponsoring ABA entities, including the Division for Public Education, the Standing Committee on Election Law, the Center for Public Interest Law, the Center on Children in the Law, the African American Affairs Committee, and the Section of State and Local Government Law. Please note, the views expressed herein have not been approved by the House of Delegate or the Board of Governors of the American Bar Association and accordingly should not be construed as representing the policy of the American Bar Association. They are the views of the individuals themselves in their personal capacities. Today's webinar will feature legal experts and advocates in what is actually the third of a total of four uh, webinars in our series, Education and Democracy. And we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has further exposed school resource disparities that we all know disproportionately impact students of color and students from low-income families. This program will examine how resource inequities uh, impact educational opportunities and outcomes, particularly for students of color and students from low-income families. Uh, we are honored today to have uh, leading civil rights litigators who will discuss historic and current efforts to expand access to quality educational opportunities for all students. Uh, and they'll also touch on ways that COVID-19 may impact our nation's most vulnerable students. So I'll begin with a uh, introduction of our speakers. At the end, we will take questions. You can ask questions of our panelists by uh, clicking on the Q&A box, which is in the center of your screen with the Q icon. Um, that's at the bottom panel in the center. And there will be time at the end for our panelists to address your questions. We're actually reserving quite a bit of time at the end. Uh, and we will also be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who is registered so that you can share widely with your networks. And, and also, please feel free to leave us feedback or ask questions uh, to follow up. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to what is really an esteemed panel of litigators and advocates uh, who will be discussing some very, very timely and urgent issues. Uh, and let me start by introducing David Chiera. He is the Executive Director of the Education Law Center in Newark, New Jersey, a which is a premier education advocacy organization. Uh, a practicing civil rights lawyer since 1978. He has litigated a wide range of cases involving socioeconomic rights, including affordable housing, shelter for the homeless, and welfare rights. Since 1996, he has litigated to enforce access for low-income children and children of color to an equal and adequate education under both state and federal laws. 
He has served as counsel to the plaintiff's students in the landmark Abbott versus Burke case, which the New York Times described as, and I quote, the most significant education case since Brown versus Board of Education. Shiera served on the uh, Federal Education Equity and Excellence Commission and is co-author of Is School Funding Fair? The National Report Card, as well as numerous other publications on public education school finance, uh, as well as education e equity. He is a consultant or serves as co-counsel on several pending funding, school funding cases and other litigation involving private school vouchers and charter schools in Colorado, Nevada, New York, Pennsylvania, California, and several other states. Uh, he will actually be pulling from his Making the Grade 2019 report, and he, today he'll discuss the status of uh, state school funding systems and the potential impacts that the COVID-19 crisis could have on education resources and opportunities. Today, uh, we're also honored to have Ajmal Qureshi, who serves as senior counsel with the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, uh, where I had the honor of working with him. In his role, Ajmal maintains a diverse caseload, spearheading LDF's work in the areas of education and economic justice, among others. In 2019, Ajmal led LDF's efforts in the case of Brand Bradford versus Maryland State Board of Education, which you'll hear more about today, a case on behalf of a class of school children in Baltimore who have been denied a constitutionally adequate education. Uh, beyond his work at LDF, Ajmal serves as director of the Civil Rights Clinic at Howard University School of Law, where he has also taught courses in torts, federal civil rights, and appellate litigation. Ajmal's editorial writings have appeared in the Baltimore Sun and the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. He has also published articles in several legal journals on topics ranging from international environmental law to the compatibility of Islam and democracy. He will discuss historic resource inequities, how they influence today's resource inequities, and as well as the significance of school facilities in the larger resource equity context. And we're also honored to have Robert Kim join us as well. Robert Kim is a leading expert in education law and policy in the United States. He is the author of Elevating Equity and Justice, 10 U.S. Supreme Court Cases Every Teacher Should Know, and co-author of Education and the Law, the fifth edition, as well as Legal Issues in Education, Rights and Responsibilities in U.S. Public Schools Today. And we'll provide links and information to all of these uh, great sources. Um, from 2017 to 2019, Bob was a William T. Grant Distinguished Fellow at Rutgers University, where he examined the role of school finance research and policymaking and advocacy. From 2011 to 2016, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary in the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights in the Obama administration. And he will discuss federal and state roles and responses related to resource equity, particularly the current responses to COVID-19. And we're honored to begin with David Chiara. Hey, thanks, Janelle, um, and, and greetings to everybody. Um, I've been assigned the task of kind of setting the stage for our discussion and providing a national overview. And I would say, like everything else in, our, in all of our work, um, this um, discussion we're having today has um, uh, changed on a dime, if you will, with the um, uh, impact of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the closing of public schools uh, across in, our, in many states and beginning across the country, um, the shift to remote learning, et cetera, uh, and the prospect of um, um, a severe economic downturn. So uh, what had started out to be a discussion about how we can improve um, resources, funding and resources in our state public school systems has kind of shifted to uh, what can we expect um, heading into this pandemic uh, 
uh, in terms of impact on resources and opportunities and funding um, of, uh, in states across the country and school districts. So, as I mentioned, my task is to sort of set the, set the stage for this conversation on a, on a more national level. Uh, so, um, so let me just launch in and, and, and uh, um, make a few sort of basic points. Um, as you'll see, uh, the, the first point is that heading into the, this pandemic as it begins, um, the issue of resource inequity, equity or really inequity, um, uh, you know, is, 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 was pressing to begin with. Let me put it that way. Um, and there's a couple points to make about that. Our state systems of finance, uh, given that the states control uh, the vast bulk of funding that goes to public education, whether it's uh, state aid or the extent to which local school districts can raise money off the property tax, so forth and so on. Those are state decisions made in the state capital, as we all know. And um, those of us that have been involved over the years in trying to press the states to fulfill their constitutional obligations under their state constitutions uh, to maintain and support adequate systems of public education that are serve all kids and, and to provide the funding necessary to ensure that all schools are well resourced and provide meaningful opportunities for, for students, particularly vulnerable populations of students. Those state uh, funding systems um, are uh, in bad shape in most states, um, to put it bluntly. Um, we have uh, a well documented uh, state system, what I call state system underfunding. In many states, it's chronic and severe. Um, in many states, the level of funding um, um, really for decades um, is low, the overall level of funding for all kids. And most importantly, what we see in many states is that there's no real increase in funds um, for at-risk students, for low-income students, students with special needs, and for districts across states and schools that serve high concentrations of poor kids. Um, what we know from school funding research, it's now settled research um, in my mind, and I think a lot of researchers would agree with this, is that a fair school funding system or an adequate school funding system really has two components. One is an adequate level for all students to deliver state academic standards and provide the essential resources that students need to achieve, but it also requires additional resources, funding and resources uh, for students that have special needs. And those are generally low income students, students in concentrated poverty, English language learners, and of course, students with disabilities. So uh, a fair school funding system or an adequate school funding system has to attempt to provide the funding uh, to deliver both of those elements and in most of our states that is not uh, uh, that is not the case just as we start into the the pandemic i did want to um, uh, um, i don't know how to get it up here but i had a chart from our making the grade report our last report card on on school funding um, and that report if I can see if I can find it. Um, nope, can't do it. Anyway, I will, I will paraphrase it. If you go to education law center, edlawcenter.org and look for making the grade 2019, it's our latest analysis of, of, of state school funding systems uh, in all of the states. And what you'll see in those, um, in, in that report is that we have a vast um, a vast um, a difference in, in the level of funding across states, uh, very low uh, funding in many states uh, to higher levels of funding in states like New York and Vermont. But most importantly, we also see in many states uh, a lack of additional funding for districts that serve high concentrations of poor students, what we call a regressive funding system. Uh, the other part of that going into the pandemic uh, in terms of school funding in the states is that a lot of states do not make um, a significant effort in 
in, um, oh, there we go, uh, in, um, in, uh, in, in investment effort in investing in their public schools. So this just gives you the grades of each state. Uh, you can see that many states really are at the bottom in terms of the actual level of funding. Uh, funding distribution means, do they, does a state provide more funding as need increases? So many of our states do not do that. Either they're regressive, they provide less funding to poorer districts. We have a lot of states that are still in that situation. Um, uh, or they provide very little, they're flat. Um, only a handful of states really make a, a serious effort to provide significant more funding as poverty concentration increases. And the last column is on funding effort, which is really important. And that's a, that's a measure of, is the state devoting a, a reasonable level of its uh, uh, GD, state GDP uh, to investing in public schools? And as you can see, so many of our low funded and underfunded states uh, are not making the fiscal effort to make the investments in our children and our schools that are required. Um, so, um, see if we can go back to the slides. Um, Holly, can we do that? Let's see how do we do that. Okay. Uh, there we go. Okay. So, the other point I want to make because it's relevant to where we are right now with the COVID-19 pandemic beginning. Um, and that's that some states have not even fully recovered from the 2008 recession. Um, so when the 2008 recession hit, uh, a lot of states cut state aid for education in their budgets. Uh, and uh, and as has been documented, and it's really reflective in the, the data that I just showed you, or the grades that I just showed you, um, a lot of states e have not even fully put back the money that they cut in the last recession. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. Uh, and states are still, we're just, are just becoming, a lot of states are just coming back um, uh, in, in the last few years with additional aid coming into their schools and restoring a lot of the cuts that they had to make a decade ago. Um, and why is this all important? Uh, if you don't have money, you don't have the resources. It's as simple as that. Um, the harm that occurs when there's not sufficient funds going into schools, districts and schools, uh, is played out, as so many of us know, uh, in local districts and schools by a lack of essential, what we call, you know, what is considered essential education resources. And numerous studies and reports are constantly coming out. We see this all the time in states where uh, schools lack qualified, uh, sufficient funding to to develop and sustain and recruit a qualified teacher workforce across their state, uh, particularly in high needs districts. We see uh, important now a lack of support staff for students such as nurses, guidance counselors, social workers, academic interventions for poor kids, access to preschool, reasonable class size. Uh, these are all essential resources that are critical to giving kids, uh, particularly kids who have additional needs uh, a meaningful opportunity to achieve. And to achieve what? To achieve the very state standards that the very standards, academic standards that the state uh, is, uh, uh, is expecting them to achieve. So, um, so this is sort of the picture coming into the pandemic. Uh, it's not a, as we all know, it's not a, it's not a, 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 a good picture. Uh, it's a picture of, in many states, chronic and severe underinvestment in our schools. Um, uh, a lot of us were beginning to make progress through litigation and through advocacy to get state legislatures to step up to the plate. Things were starting to move in the right direction, but we still had a long way to go. Um, so Ali, can you get to the next slide and I'll, we'll go to the, where we are with the um, pandemic. Or maybe I can do it. Uh, let's see. So maybe Ali, can you do that? It's on your screen. Can you move that to the next place? Sure. Uh, I, I did go to the next slide. Do you not see it? I do not see it. All right. See the first one. Oops. 
Okay. Got it. Oh, there we go. Great. I got it now. Thank you so much. Um, so what I want to do is um, we're already, I think those of us in the field that are work, have been working on, on, as I mentioned, on trying to increase investments and recruit and, and, and uh, secure reforms in our funding systems um, are now pivoting. And they're pivoting to, to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on schools and resources. Uh, and we've just begun to think about this. So these are very preliminary thoughts. Um, some of it is based on our experience at Education Law Center uh, and with uh, our partners across the country in dealing with the, the significant cuts to education budgets a decade ago, more than a decade ago in the, in the 2008 recession. Uh, so we have a little bit of experience with this, but nothing, and that was a very severe uh, uh, recession, but this is a, 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 this is a whole different situation. So what I'd like to do now is just to give you a sense from where we sit at the moment um, about the impact of the pandemic on uh, resource equity, if we can call it that, and, 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 and resources in our schools. So the first point is um, the impact of, school, of, of massive school closure on resources. And the point I want to make here is that a number of states have closed schools um, and are moving towards remote instruction uh, for students. Everybody. We've never had a situation where we've essentially transitioned out of physical classrooms, physical school buildings, having teachers actually in front of students uh, to trying to um, provide learning, meaning effective and equitable learning opportunities for children online or remotely. Um, and uh, the point I want to make here is that I think what's coming into focus now is the fact that our schools are literally are, are, are significantly unprepared for this challenge in terms of resources. And it actually uh, goes back to the previous discussion. What I was just saying previously is that it shows a, a tremendous lack of investment in our schools. Frankly, we should have been prepared as a nation to have all of our public schools ready for something like this with the technology, with the access to, with giving students access to the internet, with the hardware, software, with the preparation of teachers, uh, with the with, uh, materials and instructional um, um, uh, services uh, for, for students and students that have special needs. Uh, but what we see is that uh, schools have on the dime closed in a, in, a, in, a, in a condition that's kind of like hospitals in a way, when you think about it, lacking the sort of essential tools that they need to basically transition their student populations from education in a physical building to remote instructional opportunities. Uh, and that requires a tremendous amount of resources and the gaps in those resources are starting to uh, become significant, become evident. Um, with schools struggling to figure out what to do, uh, with schools trying to deal with kids who don't have computers, who don't have access to internet, struggling with what to do for students that require additional services, on, uh, you know, particularly students with disabilities, so forth and so on. And we even have, even have seen in states like Pennsylvania, the state kind of throwing its hands up and essentially delegating its responsibility to maintain and support its legal responsibility and constitutional responsibility to maintain and support a system of free public education to its local districts, leaving them to decide whether to stay open uh, uh, remotely to provide, continue to provide remote learning opportunities or just to close all together and say, we'll see you when you come back, um, which I would argue is a significant violation of the state's constitutional obligation to its school children across the state to make sure that the schools stay open, to provide the supports and assistance and, and resources that, that, that are necessary to, to do the best that those schools can uh, to continue to provide effective and equitable learning opportunities for students. I worry here, so, so that's number one. So there's a resource, the resource implications of school closure from the underinvestment in our schools uh, uh, um, is is uh, is is becoming um, 
you know, all too common in news stories and in reports every single day now. And so that's the first big issue. I do know that the stimulus bill that was just passed or in the Senate, and I guess it's in the House now, the 13.5 billion, uh, that money is dedicated to this bucket of resources as I read it. Uh, it, it, it it's a, there's a lot of discretion, but that's sort of the direction of the first round of stimulus money that's likely to come out of Congress to the states in short order. It's really to deal with the, the resource deficits, if you will, in shifting entire student populations from physical schools to home remote learning. Um, so, uh, so, so that's the first issue. The second issue I wanna raise is what happens when schools reopen? Uh, what happens when we get to the point where schools, uh, where we've recovered and schools can open their doors to students again? Well, I think we have to face candidly, and states need to face this. State education departments, governors, legislatures need to face the fact that what's likely to happen because of we're unprepared uh, uh, resource-wise for this remote instruction at large, we're going to have significant numbers of students coming back to school with learning loss, who've going to have lost instructional time, who've going to lost services um, that need to be made up, or what we call in the special education world compensatory education services. But it's going to be beyond kids with disabilities, English language learners, kids who are homeless, uh, poor students who've missed elementary school kids, it's, a, it's not easy to do remote learning for kids in the early grades, preschool children. There are vulnerable populations or target populations that we know are likely to come back to school when they reopen with significant resource needs to make up learning loss and get them back on track as quickly as possible. We need to start having a national conversation about this right now. And states need to be preparing to assess those needs and preparing for what will be a significant demand uh, for additional resources uh, to deal with what could be compensatory education on a mass scale. Um, I would hope that the, when Congress gets to its next stimulus bill, um, which they're talking about, which is more about recovery, that this will be a, that we can, we can start the conversation here today uh, and start to get prepared to have that conversation with Congress about what states are going to need to deal with this problem, which is to get kids up to speed uh, who've suffered significant learning loss. The third thing is what's going to happen with cuts, um, similar to the recession. We already are seeing signs that some states are gearing up uh, to make cuts in education budgets. It's likely to happen. Um, get ready for it. Uh, these could be deep, uh, they could be extended. Um, and the point I wanna make, and this will be similar, it could be on the order of what we saw in the 2008 recession. Uh, and there are a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, and, 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 and as advocates, the advocacy side are gonna have to really gear up to be able to push back against this. So what we saw in Tennessee just last Friday was a $40 million, roughly $40 million cut to their education budget, you know, while at the same time they approved $40 million for vouchers, um, for private school vouchers. But the point is, is that what we're gonna, what, what we can anticipate is that state legislatures due to revenue declines will be looking at their budgets. The biggest item, expenditure item in state budgets is public education. And they're, they're likely to uh, start cutting. Uh, and that's gonna have some significant impact on districts and schools on top of the resource demands that I just described from the school closure, the impact of the school closure. Um, two things I'll say about the 2008 recession that we learned, that, and then I'm gonna stop uh, and turn it over to, to Ajmel and, and Robert. Um, we learned from the 2008 recession uh, cuts that the state made a significant lesson that I think we all need to take away from here today. And that is when states cut state aid out of their budgets, that's what they cut. So when states need to cut from their budgets, it's state education aid. And whenever states cut state education aid, those cuts fall the hardest on the poorest districts, the most vulnerable students. I can't emphasize that enough. 
Those are the districts that rely more heavily on state aid uh, because they have low wealth, low property wealth. They're often in what we call tax overburden locally. They're tapped out locally in terms of their local tax base and raising more money off the property tax. Suburban districts can make up uh, uh, cuts like this often by going to the local taxpayers. Urban, rural, and uh, um, um, property poor districts, if you will, cannot. Uh, and this is all due to the kind of reliance, and it's very state to state, but all states have some reliance, some more than others, on the local property tax for to fund public education. So we have to be prepared to push back in the state houses when these states start talking about state aid cuts, because we know those cuts are going to impact the most vulnerable students, uh, the students whose education rights are most at risk. That's number one. Number two is we have to be aware of what happened with federal stimulus. Um, the federal stimulus, that those of you remember, uh, went in, a lot of money went in to the state education funding systems to make up the cuts that the states made in state aid. And when the federal stimulus went away, they never, they never put the money back in. So if Congress is going to take up a recovery stimulus, we have to be on the front lines demanding that they put in strong, much stronger maintenance of effort requirements so that we don't run into a situation we ran into in 2010, 2011, where states cut significant amounts of aid, state aid out of their school funding systems, filled it with federal stimulus money, and when the stimulus money dried up, uh, they, never, they never put it back. And, and, and we're still, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of our, a lot of our states, a lot of districts in our in, in states are, have still not recovered from that situation. So I'm going to stop there, uh, um, Janelle, and turn it back over to you. Thanks so much, David. Uh, and I will turn it over to Ajmal Qureshi with the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody is doing well or as well as they can possibly be. I think uh, many of you probably, like me, are sitting in your living rooms or your, your, your kitchens or your bathrooms even <laughs> even maybe watching uh you know i just appreciate the time that you're taking out to tune in to watch this today i know we're all in the new normal and uh it's a little bit of uh awkward but also uh ambiguous mysterious situation as to what's going to happen next and it would be weird if I didn't at least say a couple words about that. I'd like to thank Janelle for organizing this, David for his you know, always wise words, and I know Robert is just going to knock it out of the park too when, when he goes. Um, so with, with that, all that said, I'm sort of your, your mustard, your ketchup between the meat and the bread of the other panelists, and what I'm going to be talking about today is a, a little bit about the Bradford case. It's a case, it's the state, or it's not a statewide case, but it is the state uh, funding case in the state of Maryland. It concerns the inadequacy of funding for Baltimore City public schools. And I'm gonna I'm gonna launch into the details of the Bradford case in a second, but a couple of framing points that I think might be useful before I get into it. And I think they're really spurred by two things that that David said. First, in a pre-COVID-19 world, uh, you know, the argument that you hear in response when you're litigating a lot of these cases is that, look, we're giving the same amount of money per pupil to students as Baltimore from the state as we are to students in other counties throughout the state. So what are you complaining about? You know, sometimes we're in a world where we're even giving more money in a particular annual year to students in Baltimore than we're giving to students per pupil in another part of the state. And I think the, arg the argument or the point that that argument misses is that we don't live in, in a neutral world. We don't live in a world where everybody starts at the same place. Maryland, like many of the states that you probably live in, has a history of discrimination, a history of segregation, and a history of defunding of districts, school districts in particular. And just so, just because districts are being provided an equal amount 
in a particular year, that doesn't account for the history of discrimination that students in a particular district have faced. And so that's the argument you always hear. And I think it's the argument that many of us deal in our work across different issues that we're working on is just because things are equal right now, that doesn't make up for or account for the very recent history of discrimination in many of these places. So that's my first meta thought before I launch into the details of Bradford. Now in a post COVID-19 world, I think the other meta thought that I have is that crisis deepens inequities. And so not only do we have this history of discrimination that leads us leads people not to be starting at the same place, but you have a situation where every time there is a crisis, whatever the national crisis is, it deepens inequities. How does that happen? So let's take the state of Maryland, for example, because that's uh, where the Bradford case is, and it's also the state where I happen to live. Uh, and so you have a situation where certain districts will be handing out Chromebooks to all of their students. Certain districts have enough support staff that they'll be able to fill in for teachers who aren't able to do virtual learning. And then you have other districts in which those resources are not available. And so the reality is, is that certain students, because of that crisis, will be getting a less education in the interim. How will that play out this fall? You know, David's talked a little bit about this already. Ultimately, I think my personal opinion is that there will need to be some sort of remedial education, some sort of fill-in happening. That fill-in education may happen during the school day. It may not happen during the school day. It may happen after school. Again, those people who have resources will be able to provide for transportation for their own students to make sure that they're able to access those remedial courses if they were not able to get them online while children were out of school. Those people who do not have access to provide their own individual transportation won't be able to make, make get their students the, the access to that extra education. Uh, another thing that uh, LDF or uh, I've litigated on in a variety of different contexts is summer school tuition. There are a number of districts, 21 of the 24 districts in Maryland require their students to pay tuition for summer school. That's harmful enough as it is because it creates a scenario in which indigent students are not able to retake courses during the summer the way that wealthier students are. That's going to be even worse now if many of these districts continue to charge for summer school this summer or for any remedial courses outside of the regular school day during the school year. Again, you'll have a situation where uh, the inequities will deepen because of the crisis that exists or that is occurring. So those are the two framing thoughts I wanted to put out there for you. I'll talk a little bit about the Bradford case now, and then I'll be happy to take any questions you have and appreciate your patience. So the Bradford case is a statewide, it's not a statewide case, it is the state case brought in Maryland concerning Baltimore City Public Schools. It's brought under a provision of the state constitution, Article 8, Section 1 of the state constitution in, in particular, which requires that students in Maryland receive from the state a quote unquote, thorough and efficient education. You know, David really is the, the dean of this litigation around the country. You know, he, he's certainly done the work in Abbott in New Jersey, but he all, he's also aware of all of the other cases that utilize similar provisions in, sim, in other parts of the country under similar state constitutional provisions. It was a case brought in 94. It was settled in 96. Unfortunately, the state failed to make inflation adjustments to its education formula over time, beginning in 2007. So that's really the, the genesis of the problem. Like everything else, the cost of education goes up over time. What's the classic example of that? Teacher salaries. There's a COLA adjustment that should or be made to teacher salaries, and so teacher salaries cost more over time. Unfortunately, those adjustments weren't made in Maryland beginning in 2007. Districts that had their own local education funding available were able to fill that gap, surprise, surprise, two of the poorest as well as two of the districts with the highest uh, minority concentrations in Maryland were not able to fill those gaps because of historical inequities. That led to a situation where as of 2017, Baltimore City Public Schools had a $342 million adequacy gap. It's an annual number. So every single year, by 2017, according to the state's own studies, the state study that I'm not that I'm citing, not something that a nonprofit 
or that LDF did, Baltimore City Public Schools were being under, underfunded by $342 million annually. That relates to operations and programmatic work that doesn't even touch upon facilities deficiencies. Baltimore City Public Schools has an additional facility deficiency of about $3 billion total. So that means it would take about $3 billion total to fix all of the facility problems in Baltimore. If you wanted to replace all of the schools with serious problems, that would take about five billion dollars. As research has found, these deficiencies, both in facilities problems as well as operational funding, leads to serious deficiencies in the academic achievement of students who attend Baltimore City Public Schools. Uh, here's just a couple of numbers I'll throw out at you. The graduation rate in Baltimore City Public Schools is 17 points lower than the state average. Baltimore City Public Schools have the highest student to teacher ratios in the entire state. Almost 20% of teachers in Baltimore City Public Schools lack certification. That's uh, compared to 2.2% next to uh, in its neighboring co Baltimore County. Only 13% of fourth and eighth graders in Baltimore City Public Schools at, at grade level. Um, Baltimore, there's a state ranking system where uh, schools in, in all across Maryland, including in Baltimore, get rated between one stars and five stars, five star being the highest, one star being the lowest. Baltimore City has more one star schools than, rest, than the rest of the state combined times two. Uh, there's been a well-known history of heating and cooling problems, as you probably know. 87 schools in Baltimore City Public Schools were without heat in January of 2018. 60 schools closed, and then 70 schools closed the following summer because of air conditioning problems as well. Um, as David touched upon, like many districts that face these problems, Baltimore City Public Schools is almost 80% Black. That is the highest percentage in the entire state. And then it also is about, has 88% of students that attend Baltimore City Public Schools are eligible for free and reduced meals. That is the highest percentage in the state as well. Um, so I think when we're talking about these problems, I'm sure none of these statistics, unfortunately, surprise you. But I, I really wanted to touch back on those two meta points that I started at the beginning. When you do this litigation, or really any sort of civil rights litigation, uh, you're going to hear the same arguments over and over again, that look, we're giving them the same money right now as we're giving everybody else. And, and you have to acknowledge the history of discrimination and the effects of that history of discrimination. Because if you look at things in the microcosm of this present moment, you're not catching the entire story of how people got to where they are right now. And second, as I, as I said earlier, you have to be aware and be conscious of the changes that are being right now and how those changes are going to deepen the divides that already exist. I appreciate your time and look forward to your questions. Thanks so much, Ajmal. Uh, and we will transition to Bob Kim. Thanks, Janelle. And thank you, um, David and Ajmal and Janelle and Ali for having me. And welcome to everybody. Uh, I will um, echo Ajmal's opening and saying, I hope everyone's doing OK out there. Um, I'm in currently reporting from New York City, so I feel a little bit like uh, I'm in the bullseye of the coronavirus, but hopefully we'll all make it through OK. Um, I will share that if there is one uh, salutary benefit for uh, stay at home and social distancing, uh, I do happen to uh, moonlight doing some work um, at the higher education level on Title IX enforcement. And it turns out that social distancing is not such a bad thing when it comes to sort of keeping down our Title IX dockets. So I say that with a sort of 10% facetiousness there. Um, I just want to start out and, and uh, um, say a couple of opening thoughts here, which is, um, you know, we're talking about school inequity in the time of coronavirus. Um, I think that first of all, we have to recognize that schools are doing and teachers are doing heroic work to try to both deal with their home environments and maintain some le level of connection with their students. So in some time, in some ways, uh, we have to recognize that this is a, um, uh, once in a generation, hope, you know, once in a, a many decades type of um, unprecedented event here. 
And so to the extent that there is some diminishment of um, educational opportunity for all students, but in particular for some students, um, I think we have to recognize that these are the times that we're in and that there's heroic work being done by um, schools and educators and parents you know, all over the country. Um, the, the two macro things that I think I worry about and echoing the other panelists, um, one is the long-term effects of this, uh, what is sure to be another great recession. Um, if we are uh, looking at it uh, honestly and projecting into the future here. Um, and so the, what are the long-term effects of this downturn economically on schools in terms of resources provided to schools, uh, cuts that we will, that will take a generation to kind of come back from. And, uh, you know, David mentioned this move to privatization, even in, in one anecdote about one state. Uh, um, uh, you know, I worry about that too. What are the systemic trends that might result from this sudden shift to uh, uh, diminished school calendars and um, uh, you know, distance learning for the remainder. So the systemic shifts and the long-term effects on schools, I think is one thing I worry about. And then secondly, and this is echoing what, what Ajmal and David both said, is the impact to specific student populations. Obviously, we're gonna talk about students with disabilities here. Um, we do know that um, there's an obligation to maintain free appropriate public education. Students with the IEPs need continued services. Uh, continued related services, um, and there's specific issues with respect to distance education around um, websites, around uh, accessibility of websites and accessibility of, of schoolwork documents, um, audiovisual materials, online learning platforms, and so forth that need to be, uh, in which students with disabilities need to be accommodated. Um, other populations we, sh we haven't touched on yet, but we should uh, at least a little bit are uh, English language learners. You know, when we go to distance learning, um, there are so many services and uh, that are needed for English learners that um, are difficult when uh, we have no live services, no translation, um, no um, opportunity for the rich bilingual um, dual language plat um, learning um, opportunities that exist with full day school. So English learners, we have to pay attention to also communication with parents of limited uh, English speaking parents during this, this crisis. What are the implications when there's a great reliance on email uh, communication as to what's happening in schools and, and continued learning during this crisis. So certainly English learners and their, their parents or families. And then obviously low income and homeless students. Um, you know, we, we, we're with increased learn, uh, reliance on internet, on the avail availability of a laptop or a cell phone. Um, these are things that we take, many of us take for granted, but if you think about the 114,000 homeless students, for example, in New York City, um, the least thing that they're worried about, that they can be concerned about is uh, uh, whether they have connectivity to a laptop and are able to get some instruction, uh, even though we're, they're at home. Um, they, they are looking literally for food um, and for continuation of sustenance during this time. So, you know, a thought for these specifically vulnerable populations. Um, let, let me talk a little bit about, um, and I'm gonna try to keep this at a high level, the federal and state responses to um, the coronavirus and also what the implications are for resource equity in schools moving forward. Um, starting with the federal response, um, I guess it makes sense to say that, you know, we're all sort of reading this in live time now about the imminent passage of the stimulus package, the $2 trillion stimulus package that was passed in the Senate. Um, you guys may know it before me, whether the House and the President signed that um, sometime in the next day or so. Um, but uh, we do know um, now from the CARES Act um, passed in the Senate that uh, there's about 30 billion dedicated toward education, of which, as David mentioned, 13.5 billion goes to K-12 schools, 14.25 billion goes to higher ed. The, uh, the K-12 portion is known as the Education Stabilization Fund. Um, and then there's another three billion that's dedicated at the discretion of each governor to go to either K-12 or higher ed. So um, that's sort of the overall pool of money that um, is going toward K-12 education. Um, there's other pots of money that are worth noting, you know, 69 million to Bureau of Indian Education Schools, 750 million to Head Start, 
$15.5 billion for SNAP, and um, also a $25 million uh, pool for rural development, and that can go toward distance learning for our rural, rural communities and schools. So, um, you know, overall, um, that's what we're talking about. I will note that that is far short of what advocates asked for. It's far short of what the House bill, uh, House version of this stimulus um, um, provided. And if we compare it to the Recovery Act of uh, 2009, that was a $787 billion um, piece of legislation of which about $100 billion were dedic was dedicated in some way for uh, P through 20 uh, education. Mm -hmm. Some people will say that uh, between 59 and $77 billion of the uh, Recovery Act went toward K-12 education in one form or another. So if you compare, this stimulus is about three or four times uh, lower in, in amount than uh, the Recovery Act in 2009. Um, the other quick point to mention about the, uh, the CARES Act that's pending right now is that it provides for a 30-day waiver for Secretary DeVos to come up with a plan to figure out whether there will be waivers in terms of um, for IDEA for the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act um, and Section 504 of the Rehab Act and the Perkins Act. So advocates, you know, I would watch out in these 30 days, we need to be clear to the secretary uh, what is permissible and what's not in terms of waivers uh, in, in her plan, which is due within 30 days to Congress. Um, key among that, I think, is the maintenance of effort that David was mentioning um, that is included in, the, uh, in ESSA um, that uh, could potentially be waived um, by the secretary. So we need to watch out for that. Um, in terms of um, other um, federal responses to the coronavirus, I will note in passing here that we, there were a spate of guidances that came out from the Department of Education. Um, you may, I'll commend you to look at um, ed.gov slash coronavirus. There was a March 4 guidance, a very short guidance around discrimination and harassment, uh, particularly uh, directed at Asian Americans uh, as a result of the coronavirus. Obviously it doesn't help that much that the president's continuing to refer to this as the Chinese virus. Um, but putting that aside, um, there was that guidance. There was also a bunch of fact sheets um, dating from March 12th, March 16th, and March 21 around um, uh, 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 civil rights issues that pertain to the coronavirus. And I think the bulk of the guidance is, is, is um, uh, sort of surrounding uh, how to provide for students with disabilities during this downturn. Um, the, the main guidance um, did advise correctly that, um, that we have to, schools are obligated to the extent that students have IEPs to continue ensuring FAPE and to provide for um, uh, services during this downturn. To the extent that um, schools are open, they need to provide for those things. Um, there was a recent correction uh, out of concern from the advocates uh, that, that um, you know, schools could not, schools were not providing, uh, there was concern that, that in order to provide for distance learning accessibility for students with disabilities, that that was creating this hardship and could schools not provide any distance learning because of that concern. Um, the secretary wrote back on May 21st saying, that's not the case, that schools should go forward with distance learning and they should not, uh, maybe she overstated this, um, that they don't, they don't have to um, uh, uh, be concerned uh, with the obstacles presented by accessibility. They should go forward and provide distance learning and then let's take care of the uh, needs of students with disabilities also to the extent possible. Um, but there's some confusion around that um, as well and it just shows how hard it is to sort of navigate civil rights in the time of this um, kind of sea change in how we're delivering education to students. Um, I will say that um, uh, uh, now that we're talking, we're also talking about resource equity, um, you know, advocates should be aware that, that there's still an OCR guidance pending uh, that still has not been rescinded. Maybe it will be after we, I talk about it. But um, the 2014 resource equity guidance put out by ed.gov, which requires, you know, pandemic or no pandemic, that equitable resources be provided to all schools. And that's federal, federal guidance here. And um, I would 
I also commend that folks look at that 2014 guidance because it sort of maps out um, four domains, including courses and activities, teachers, uh, facilities, and instructional materials as areas that schools have to provide equitable uh, resources uh, uh, within school districts. Um, so that's still live. Um, also still live is the civil rights data collection, which um, can be found at um, ocrdata.ed.gov, which gives every school district and individual school in the country data on how, whether educational equity is being provided to students based on race, based on disability, gender, and other categories. Um, so those are two still live uh, federal pieces of um, guidance and data that um, I think are useful as we track equity in the future. Um, and I do think that we will need to, as we watch the impact of this, you know, unfolding economic collapse that, that may happen in the next couple of months, the impact, uh, the civil rights implications of school closures on particular students um, uh, based on race or income, um, the widening of inter-district and intra-district resource disparities, um, the the implications of greater student and family poverty and the ability of students in those families to obtain education. Um, and really, as, as we mentioned before, the growing comparative disadvantage or inequities faced by low income English learner and students with disability populations that are caused by prolonged distance learning. Um, the longer this thing goes on, I think the greater the attendant obligations are of school districts to provide for equitable solutions uh, to these vulnerable populations. Um, we all understand that in the short term, schools are scrambling, but the longer this thing goes on, I think the greater the obligations are legally uh, and morally to provide solutions for these populations. Um, I don't have much time to go into the state response, but um, I'll just share in a nutshell or anecdotally that um, uh, for the past couple of years, I was uh, doing research on uh, to what extent State, uh, state legislators and advocates um, rely on school finance research and data to inform their decision making and their legislating around uh, providing equitable school funds. And um, I guess, you know, maybe, maybe some of my observations are, might be useful for advocates out there and lawyers as you, um, as you advocate within states. Um, but my concerns, I think, are resulting from this two-year survey of uh, many different states is that um, states have a limited ability to address massive shortfalls in education. Um, there are certain political and economic limitations within particular states that make it very difficult for them to react. Um, our states are very, very different from each other is my biggest takeaway. Some states have um, a capacity within the legislatures and the state government that um, rival the federal government. They're very robust and there's lots of staffing and capacity to deal with things. Other states um, have far, far fewer resources and staff. Um, some of our legislatures only meet for like uh, a handful of weeks every year or every two years um, and have almost zero staff to deal with emergencies and um, coming up with quick solutions to budget crises and things of that nature. So uh, I think uh, those of you working in different states, you kind of would nod your head if you're one of those states that has very few resources at the state level. We have to realize that, that not all states are equal when it comes to dealing with a crisis. Um, and certainly that also goes for the advocacy and uh, intermediary organization presence within these uh, uh, states. Uh, very, very different. You know, you, you can talk about a New York or a California or a Massachusetts or an Illinois, but um, you also have a swath of states um, um, that are dispersed around the country that um, there aren't really the, the intermediary advocacy organizations to hold the feet to the fire to suggest creative solutions to make sure there's equity and money continuing to flow in schools. So um, it's really the attention to the resource starved states and the advocacy starved states that we need to focus on as we address this crisis. Um, and you know, I think everyone, we all agree that really the states is really where most of the action is gonna be in terms of ensuring 
continuity of education and resources for students. The federal government provides nine or 10% of funding in, in schools and the rest 90, 91% comes from state and local governments. So that's where really the action is. And, and we're going to need um, instigator states, what I call them, to take the lead um, to influence other states in particular regions. You know, um, if uh, Idaho might listen to Wyoming, Idaho might not listen to California, but um, you know, within each region of the country, if certain states that do have capacity take the lead, I think they, the solutions that those legislatures come up with um, can have a beneficial effect on the surrounding states. So we need to focus on states where we think a difference can be made because they're really gonna be the laboratories to um, bring about change and sort of positive reform and sort of a re recovery from this, um, this uh, pandemic and, and the effects on schools. So I'll stop there and turn it back over to Janelle. Thank you so much uh, to all of our panelists. Uh, and at this time we invite uh, folks to again, click on the icon with the Q uh to enter your questions for q a this is a great opportunity to hear from uh, these leading experts on these issues that have come up related to resource inequities particularly in light of the uh, covid 19 pandemic so please uh, feel free to enter your questions one question that i will actually pose to the panelists um, uh, to all of them actually, just, just to, um, to address, what, it, what is really the role of the civil rights lawyer um, in, in trying to, to address this issue or um, in resource equity generally? And I'll just open that up. Well, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I'll say a couple words and then I'll, I'll kick it over to everyone else as well. So I think it really is, it's kind of like the wild, wild west. There's no definite answer as to what everybody obviously is doing nationwide with regards to learning in the interim. And then there's certainly no answer even within the state as to what different counties are, are doing with regards to distance learning or education in the interim. And so very concretely and at a very basic level, I think first it starts with figuring out exactly what your district is doing. I mean, I know what Baltimore is doing because I'm litigating there. And I know what the district that I live in in Maryland is doing. And I know, and I have one other case in Prince George's as well. That's the summer school tuition case. And I can tell you what all three of those districts are doing is absolutely different. And they're absolutely different in three different capacities. They're absolutely different, one, in terms of meal distribution, in terms of where meals are being distributed in the interim. They're absolutely different in terms of what distance learning looks like. I can tell you in at least one of those districts, the initial response from one of those districts was, we're not doing anything. And, and I think the sad reality is that there are a number of districts out there whose response is, we're not doing anything in the interim. And then there's a third district, which happens to be the most wealthy of those three, where again, they're distributing Chromebooks and they have over a dozen different sort of meal distribution sites. And so I think at a very basic level, I think first there's a question of figuring out what the district that you work in is doing in the interim and then making sure that what they're doing in the interim in all three of those areas is done in the most equitable way possible. Want me to jump in, David? Yeah, go ahead, Robert, then I'll add a comment. I, go ahead. I think I go back to my days as, a, as a, a young whippersnapper ACLU lawyer. This was a long time ago. <laughs> But um, I remember that, you know, litigation was a central part of what I did but as a civil rights lawyer, but it was only one part of it. There was also, you know, the legislative advocacy that um, we were responsible for, especially around bills um, that uh, the crafting of bills, the shaping of bills, the advocating for legislation, 
especially around the issues that we were responsible for. Uh, we also had to be grassroots organizers uh, on the side. And um, that was a big part of our work as well. And, you know, um, one of the perspectives that I have from the last couple of years of my work is that um, lawyers and civil rights lawyers also play this um, very important role as translators of both law and of research and data to other audiences, whether it's to stakeholders, um, whether it's to uh, policymakers or legislators, um, or to the media. And so, um, uh, lawyers for better or for worse, we are people of words. We look at policies and provisions, and um, we have a very important translational role to make sure that um, information is accessible and understandable to other audiences. So I see our role as civil rights lawyers as multifaceted in, in those particular ways. Um, and with respect to equity and the coronavirus in particular, I think that um, civil rights lawyers, we need to be looking out for um, what the, the inequities are that develop as a result of this pandemic. We, we don't know right now what they all are, but we will certainly hear from our hotlines and from our clients uh, what particular hardships they are facing as a result of coronavirus, distance learning, um, inability to um, access school resources the same way as other people. So um, our job is to really uh, put, bring those stories forward and to use all of the available research and data that we can, that we have to uh, chart the inequities and to, um, you know, when necessary, turn those into um, complaints and causes of action. So I think that that's, you know, absolutely one important role. And, and certainly we are going to need to um, put the feet to the fire to the state legislatures to, um, to not uh, 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 fall back on the federal government to make up for these education shortfalls. Uh, David mentioned, and I think other organizations like the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities have emphasized that um, uh, about half of the states have never recovered from the Recovery Act and the Great Recession in 2008 and 9. And so, um, and, and maintenance of effort was not maintained uh, in many, many states as, you know, even with the Recovery Act funds, the bottom fell out in state and local funding. So um, we really need um, advocates, civil rights lawyers to say that there will be disparate um, uh, impacts on certain populations as a result of any shortfall that persists as a result of this um, uh, pandemic and economic downturn that is certain to happen and is already happening. Um, so um, I think those are areas that civil rights lawyers can be extremely useful to try to, um, you know, stanch the flow of, of you know, of the, 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 uh, the down effects of this, uh, of the, the pandemic. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, 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 that I think that uh, most of what's going to happen in the short term is legislative. Uh, it's going to happen in state capitals. Uh, the big decisions are going to be made around state budgets and funding and, and you know, by state education commissioners and so forth. So I think um, our civil rights community has to kind of step up its mo what I would call movement lawyering game, which is to uh, immerse ourselves with our partners, our advocacy partners. There are advocates in every state, in every state that on some level varied, as Bob mentioned, in, in its capacity and strength, but there are, are advocates in every state that, 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 are, that are pressing on, uh, that have been pressing on state legislatures and governors around school funding, resource equity, so forth and so on. It's time to really uh, uh, join with them uh, and uh, work directly with them to help them uh, shape their advocacy efforts through research, through communications, uh, to be available to make demands uh, for compliance uh, on, on education officials and governors uh, and to help them shape um, um, responses, uh, alternatives to, to, to what legislators are, are looking for. You know, I, I think that's where the action is. So, so not so much in the courts. And so um, I think we have to put on our movement lawyering hats and get out there and start working with our advocacy partners, our research partners, our communications partners out in the states to, to be prepared to gear up for what is going to be 
some very big fights in our state capitals across the country. Thank you so much. Uh, and we have a few questions that have come in. Um, and I will uh, bring these up, not necessarily in order, but we will get to these, I promise. Um, and, and maybe this is David, and, and if others want to join, is, join in as well. Uh, David, you talked about uh, inequitably funded uh, states and districts. Um, do you have an example of a district or, or anyone, again, that isn't well funded, that is figuring out how to provide special education well. Uh, we could use some promising practices to share uh, with some districts in Pennsylvania. Um, I, I think that's a great question. And, and, and you know, the, the, the problem in special education, I mean, I think there are districts that are trying to do the best they can with what they have. Um, you know, they're, they're and I can't give you any specific districts in Pennsylvania that, that there are resources that are folks that are working on this there, our partners at Education Law Center Pennsylvania, Public Interest Law Center, or groups that, that are on the front lines of this. All on special education funding, I think the big issue is gonna be going forward, uh, what we've been, uh, the, 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 the um, funding impacts on special education are sort of twofold. One is that districts try to shortcut um, because they're under a lot of financial pressure. Uh, shortcut in terms of IEPs, classifying kids, providing services because they're costly. They simply, and, and special education is chronically underfunded pretty much in every state. It starts at the federal government. Second part is the impact on general education students. You see this in a lot of states across the country where Districts have to allocate off their general fund, their general the funding that they have for all students in order to make up shortfalls in special education funding. So this is a really good opportunity to start raising those issues uh, with district partners, start talking to, with districts. I think we need to do a whole lot more uh, in states across the country to elevate the, um, the difficulties in providing programs and services for kids with special uh, with disabilities, but then connecting that to these broken financing structures. Uh, and then taking it also back to the federal government, which as we all know, has shortchanged the funding I, for, of IDEA ever since it was enacted somewhat four decades ago now. So, so um, special education funding is gonna be a big issue and it's gonna be a big problem as we get into this whole area that I mentioned earlier of compensatory education that districts are gonna have to provide when kids come back to school. Um, speaking of, of compensatory education, and Ajmal, you spoke about um, some issues related to summer school. Do districts and or states have the authority to require students to attend school during the summer? And this, this probably applies to the post-COVID-19 world, if, if, if uh, depending on the timing how things are in the summer, but do districts or states have the authority to require students to attend school during the summer? My understanding is, this, somebody asked me this the other day and I looked at it at a particular state in the, in the deep south, is that most states have a number of minimal, minimum number of days that students have to attend to be counted towards getting that, their education. That requirement can be waived in a number of states, is, is my understanding, or at least it was the understanding in this particular state. So it depends upon the, the applicable state statute in your state. What is the minimum number of days that are required and whether or not there's a waiver provision and whether or not the governor or the state secretary of education has exercised that waiver provision. So those are the three things that you need to look at to answer that particular question. If I could add to that, Janelle, when you think about this question, it's, it's the answer you give for a lot, of, a lot of these issues, right? The state, uh, through their are constitutionally obligated in their state constitutions to maintain and support a free system of public schools open to all children within the state. Um, decisions about what Ajmel was just talking about, uh, decisions uh, about length, you know, the number of days kids have to be in school, when those days are, um, so forth and so on, are decisions made by state legislatures in furtherance of their constitutional obligation. The legislate, state legislatures can change that. Um, so 
uh, state legislatures have the authority, clearly have the authority to say, to, to amend their current laws to say, given the current crisis, uh, kids have to come to school in summer. Uh, you know, if, if, you know that, that obviously that has significant resource implications on the state. But clearly, the, que the question you're asking uh, is one that uh, can be that that, can, that states have the authority through their legislatures or through some kind of maybe waiver process that they might have have an effect uh, to change those policies because those policies are created uh, in each in each state by uh, state by uh, state legislatures through state statutory enactments. And and the next question, this is uh, directed. Uh, to address an issue that an educator is experiencing. Any thoughts on what a special education teacher can do to ensure that her students receive the best and most appropriate instruction during this time? Her experience and expertise tell her that remote learning attempts just won't work uh, and the teacher feels powerless. And I also think this relates to that earlier question. Are there any districts that are doing this well? I don't, I don't know if anyone has come across stories or you know, anecdotes or anything else that is, is detailing a district that, that is doing a good job of serving special education students. I was about to say that I don't have an example personally, but I do think that we should pose this to the USDOE to maybe put up on their website, uh, collect and sort of um, disseminate uh, best practices or um, sort of uh, stories from school districts that have come up with innovative ways to um, provide education. So I think it would be a great uh, request from advocacy organizations to um, the USDOE uh, to provide that. Maybe the, the um, Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services uh, within the DOE could um, take on that task of providing and disseminating that kind of um, list of examples and contacts around the country. You know, it's hard to it's hard to answer the question without knowing specifically what the what the particular particular students needs are that this teacher is dealing with, and what the you know uh, what the supports and services that might be required. I mean, there are there there you know. There, there are uh, resources available for that um, through uh, electronic and means and so forth and so on. Um, but the question itself, the fact that this teacher is isolated, um, points up the sort of larger question that, that the larger issue that I tried to raise at the outset, which is that the states are heading into this completely unprepared uh, for, for um, organizing the system across districts, across schools, across the teacher workforce, whether it's the special education teacher workforce, English language learners, teachers who, who teach bilingual education, so forth and so on, are completely unprepared um, for, with dealing, uh, to deal with this, uh, to be available to, so that this teacher isn't isolated and, and, ask, and, and trying to figure out in her school what to do uh, with her students. Um, so this gets to my point about this being a wake-up call or an opportunity for all of us to start really demanding that the states step up and start building their infrastructure, start uh, working with, well, special education is a good place to start, uh, organizing their special education community, their teachers, working with their teacher unions, working with their associ professional associations, so forth and so on, to begin to start to um, create a kind of community, um, remote community, if you will, of teachers that have access to resources, have access to help, can call somebody up, can find out if a district that's nearby or a school nearby or a teacher, maybe even that was in her school and is now working remotely, is using a particular practice that might work for her. So, you know, we're really at a, a major inflection point. And frankly, it, it's a systems problem rather than an individual problem. And unless we start to hold these states accountable for organizing these systems in ways that they can operate under these circumstances and support their teachers, support their districts, principals, whatever they are, in, in navigating 
uh, uh, this transition, uh, we're going to we're what's going to happen is what what I also said, which is this teacher student is going to wind up coming back to school needing significant compensatory education services to get him or her back on track. So the only thing that I'll add is, is, as I often say, is that even if I don't know the answer, I have good ideas on who may. And this is exactly one of those scenarios where, and then I saw who the initial question came from. It's sort of uh, someone who, who is wonderful and I've worked with in various coalitions is, is that, even if I don't know the answer, I have ideas on who may. And there, may, there are certainly disability rights networks. There are PNAs, protection and advocacy organizations in, in each of your individual states that work on these issues. And they hopefully are in the process of developing the best practices that even if they don't address exactly what should be done for an individual student, can create broad guidelines as to what should be done across the district. And so with that, you know, I'm, I'm, I think Ali has my information and Janelle does too, and I'm happy to sort of open up my email to anybody who wants to reach out. And if you're from one of probably the many states in which one of us on the call has contacts, I'd be happy to connect you either with them or the national representative for these individuals who would know exactly who the individual in that state is working and developing those best practices. So it's a very long way to say of, you know, hit me up via email and I will find the right person in your individual state who can give you the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Ajmal. Uh, another question. If someone, uh, this, this person asking the question, had a fair background in education law, both from the school district side and from the students with disability side, where is a place to contact in my area, which is Baltimore, uh, to learn and help where needed? Uh, he notes MDLC, which has changed names, was a place I volunteered in the past, uh, but from my view had very little impact on policy. Uh, I'm older and have more time for a different role. Can you give a suggestion who or where to contact uh, to be able to help and to make a difference? Sure. So I should, I should have done this earlier and remiss for not doing it. Our, we have a couple of co-counsel in our case in Bradford and the organization that's doing a lot of legwork on the ground is the ACLU of Maryland. And so I'm certainly, if you call the ACLU of Maryland, mention that you're calling about the Bradford case, indicate your background in terms of your experience and wanting to provide information. Uh, I'm sure that your words will get around back to me. And you can indicate that, you know, you, you, you heard me talking about the Bradford case. Um, why don't we take a few minutes? I, I think that's that's most of our questions, unless folks want to submit any others. Um, just for you each to go around, uh, any concluding statements? Um, what is needed? Um, any takeaways that, that you hope that uh, advocates and, and uh, attorneys on who are, who are listening, uh, joining us today, uh, can take from this conversation? I'll go first and I'll go very quickly. It, it struck me, especially as all of us are talking today, I think how unprepared almost all of us were for all of this. And so there's certainly lessons to be learned about that, although to the extent that one could prepare for something like this. But also there's tremendous opportunity in this moment because unlike other civil rights issues where it's just a particular district that's being imp impacted by this, it's all of us. So it's wherever you live, there are people in your community who are gonna be impacted worse than this by others. And so you have an opportunity again to reach out to your district, figure out what's going on, uh, work and advocate to ensure that resources are being distributed in an equitable manner in the interim to ensure that when or if schools come back uh, this year or next fall that the resources that are being provided are being provided in an equitable way because the reality is is just given the fact that we're talking about you know 300 million people being affected LDF nor any other civil rights organization can be in all of those communities, all of those school districts around the country. So it's a tremendous opportunity for everybody, lawyer or not, to step in, figure out what their district is doing, and then advocate for better solutions. And if not, litigate about it, as Robert said. Mm 
I'll just say quickly, um, just focusing um, a little bit on uh, the stimulus, um, because I think that's the most, um, it's one of the things that is coming immediately down the pike uh, to the extent that it gets distributed to schools and states um, within a reasonable amount of time from now. Um, I think one of the lessons we learned from 2009 was that um, a lot of schools, you know, this is not a huge amount of money when it's put across the country, but uh, was split up across the country. But we do know that um, there were some capacity concerns about uh, within school districts that even with the money, there was a lack of capacity to um, implement the funds, to use them in the ways that were most beneficial to students and so forth. So I think there's a real opportunity for um, advocates and, and lawyers around the country to work with local districts uh, and the state DOE to um, say, hey, we understand you got X billion dollars. Um, we want to talk with you at the first available opportunity on how the money should be spent and, um, and what capacity uh, supports we, the advocacy community can provide, whether it's connecting um, school districts to resources, you know, some of the ones that uh, you know, we're, we were trying to address here around um, you know, new ways of teaching students with disabilities um, in online formats, um, you know, connecting the, the experts in the field to the government and to school districts so that they, they really improve their capacity uh, both to um, implement the funds and then also direct them to specific services or um, uh, uh, specific for, for, uh, services or functions within the school that will help our at-risk populations. So I think, you know, I would just say that, that that's a real short-term thing that, that this audience could be helpful toward um, and really just ensuring that the money, to the extent that, that it get, does get distributed, is um, used the best way possible. Um, so Janelle, what I would say to the, uh, is a little bit of a different twist to add on to what's been said, is that you know a lot of our advocacy and a lot of our work um, and a lot of um, attention gets put on local school districts and in schools and, and, you know, especially in the era, the recent era of accountability around standards-based reform, failing schools, the schools aren't, you know, doing very well, the schools aren't meeting the needs of their kids. And, you know, that, uh, you know, not, and, 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 and that's not to say that local school districts don't need to be held accountable, but it also has the effect of, of um, letting the states off the hook uh, for their, ultimate responsibility to educate our kids. They are responsible at the end of the day for the education of each and every child in Maryland, whether they're in Baltimore and Prince George's County, wherever it is, and ensuring that those children have all the resources that they need to succeed. Same is true in New Jersey, New York, Oklahoma, Michigan, the states are responsible for this. So this is a moment where, you know, maybe we can pause a little bit and be humbled about what our local school districts now have to do, given the fact that they physically closed. And in, 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 a, in a circumstance in which they, as I mentioned before, and I can't underestimate, they are unprepared to deal with through a lack of uh, human capacity, professional capacity, resources. And this is a long, sta this is a long standing issue, uh, not something that just occurred. So what I would hope is that we recognize that and that we begin to connect with our local district officials, um, you know, community grassroots groups that are working in districts. And instead of starting pointing fingers at each other or trying to deal with a situation, frankly, that um, uh, the state has left us unprepared, the states have left local school districts and educators and teachers unprepared for, uh, to start and turn collectively towards the states, our state legislatures, our governors, our education officials, to start to demand, to really make some strong demands over the next months uh, to, to begin to deal with the problems that we've been talking about today, um, and especially to put us in a position where we can stand up when the legislature is getting ready to cut the education budget again. Uh, in this kind of circumstance, which will 
ultimately fall down on our local districts and schools and educators and make it much more difficult for them to deal with the, the students since they have to serve, that we can begin to um, we can begin to start to join, you know, cause, if you will, uh, to, to get the states to hold them accountable, to operate the system under these circumstances in a way that's effective and equitable for all the children that reside within, uh, whether it's Alabama or Mississippi or, or, or you know, Idaho, Colorado, it doesn't matter. So, um, and the other thing I would say is that we, I think we have to demand that the states uh, and the federal government essentially in this period of school closure, eliminate all of the, through waivers or through a mandatory legislation or whatever it is, eliminate all of the accountability standards, testing requirements, you know, the things that they've loaded on to districts and schools over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and focus singularly so that the singular focus of everyone's energy can be on one thing and one thing only. And that is, given that we're gonna have to try to educate kids at a distance or remote from the classroom, and we're unprepared for that, as you, the questions that have come up have already indicated, we don't, we're, not, we're not ready for this. What do we need to do to, make, to focus everybody's energy on that one singular task? Teachers shouldn't have to be worried about taking the state assessments. Uh, school districts shouldn't be worried about what grades they're gonna get on, their schools are gonna get on the accountability measures. All of that needs to be set aside for, for the time being. Um, so that all of our energies, collective energies, whether you're an advocate, a civil rights lawyer, uh, a parent, a teacher, union official, whatever it might be, administrator, principal, can be focused on that singular miss mission, A, and B, really pushing back up to the state to make sure that, that they're, they're acting in a manner that's supportive, completely supportive through resources, through not making budget cuts, whatever it might be, uh, to, to, uh, to, to get us through this period of distance learning and also to prepare our schools for the tremendous um, uh, responsibility that they're gonna have and demand that they're gonna have uh, uh, to, to, um, uh, to uh, uh, that their students will bring back to school. Right when they reopen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thanks so much to, to all of our panelists uh, today. I want to remind folks, first of all, and, and thanks for everyone for joining us as well. Um, for, four, for more than five decades, the section and its members have worked on hundreds of issues, addressing a broad range of civil rights, civil liberties, and international human rights. Uh, today, the section continues to promote policies affecting religious freedom, LGBTQ rights, gender equity, and other significant civil rights issues. Um, we're also being impacted and doing a lot of work to bring you uh, programming like this that addresses the current uh, health crisis. Uh, so we do at, humbly ask you to please consider making a donation to our section. Uh, you'll see the web address there. Um, to support civil rights lawyers, to support this kind of education and information uh, dissemination so we can all be responsive uh, to this current health crisis and to other issues that may arise. Uh, your gift will help to make our efforts possible uh, for decades to come. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you for your, your commitment, your dedication to this work. Thank you to our phenomenal panelists uh, and to the ABA staff uh, who is doing a range of programs on uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So thank you all. Uh, and have a good uh, afternoon or evening, depending on your which coast you're on.